Hello and welcome to everyone. You know, folks are still joining. We're at the top of the hour. I'll probably give it another 30 seconds or so before we get started. Welcome, welcome. Welcome all. Okay. We'll get started now. So hello and welcome to today's event from the Council on Criminal Justice. I'm Stephanie Kennedy, the Policy Director here at the Council. Today, I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar exploring crime trends in our nation's crime data infrastructure. If this is your first time joining a Council on Criminal Justice event, welcome. And if you've attended one of our events before, welcome back. The Council was founded to advance understanding of the criminal justice policy choices facing the nation and build consensus for data-driven solutions that enhance safety and justice for all. We are a nonpartisan think tank and invitational membership organization, and we're guided by the belief that a fair and effective justice system is, a vi is vital to democracy and a core measure of our nation's well-being. That mission has driven our members and staff to take on some of the most pressing and high-profile issues in our field. The impact of COVID-19 on our criminal justice system, reform of law enforcement policy and practice, violence in our communities, and racial disparities, just to name a few. Today, we explore another high-profile issue in our field, crime in our communities. The Council's Mid-Year Crime Trends Report and a series of fact sheets about crime trends were released this morning. The Crime Trends Report, the 13th in a series, presents data from 2018 through the first six months of 2024 for a sample of 39 cities. The first report in this series was published in July of 2020, shortly after the start of the pandemic. At that time, national crime trends data for 2020 wouldn't be released until the fall of 2021, a gap of nearly 18 months. These crime trends reports provided and continue to provide timely crime trend data to ground policy, practice, and narratives about crime in evidence. To address the gaps in available national crime data, the Council launched the Crime Trends Working Group in April of 2023. This is a group of expert producers and consumers of criminal justice statistics who sought to explore and explain current crime trends and build consensus for significant improvements in the nation's capacity to produce timely, accurate, and complete crime data. The final recommendations released last month were designed to improve our crime data infrastructure and make near real-time national crime trends data reporting a reality. Today, we'll hear from one of the lead authors of the Crime Trends Report series, CCJ Senior Research Specialist, Ernesto L. Lopez. We'll also hear from two members of the working group, Drew Evans, the Superintendent of the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension for the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, and Janet Lauritsen, the Curator's Distinguished Professor Emerita in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. We'll also hear from Alex Picaro, Senior Advisor to the Working Group. Alex is a Professor of Sociology and Criminology and an Arts and Sciences Distinguished Scholar at the University of Miami and a former Director of the Bureau of Justice Statistics. So thank you for joining us as we explore what's happening in communities like yours across the nation and talk about tangible steps to put timely, accurate, usable, and complete national crime trends data in your hands. Before we begin our program, a few notes. To ensure a quality experience for everyone, all lines are muted, but we want to hear from you. Throughout today's session, you can submit questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you're a member of the media, we ask you to please identify your outlet in your submitted question. We'll take as many questions as possible throughout today's session, and if we don't get to yours, please feel free to email us. My colleague will put our email address in the chat. And with that, I welcome Ernesto Lopez to provide an overview of our mid-year 2024 crime, year, crime Trends Report. I also want to extend gratitude to the New York Times, USA Today, Axios, and the New York Post for their coverage. We will share a link to that report with you now for you to review in detail. To you, Ernesto. Thank you, Stephanie, for that introduction. Next slide, please. Um, as Stephanie said, these will be the panelists uh, for today's discussion. 
Next slide. Most of my presentation today will be focused on our mid-year 2024 Crime Trends Update, which I co-authored with Bobby Boxman from the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Um, next slide. But as Stephanie mentioned, we also have a series of fact sheets uh, that were uh, recently released that focus on homicide, motor vehicle theft, assaults, burglary, larceny, and robbery. Throughout my presentation, I'm going to highlight a few of these fact sheets and how they can help contextualize lar longer term trends uh, in, in crime. After the presentation, I, after our, our webinar today, I encourage you to take a look at our report and our fact sheets. Next slide. So this has been an ongoing effort uh, for CCJ going back to 2020, as Stephanie mentioned, um, there's this looks at 39 cities uh, across 12 offenses from 2018 to June, 2024. Uh, as we've tracked crime over this period, we, we've noticed uh, a few changes in trends. First, that homicide is lower uh, than 2019 levels uh, compared to the last six months. So the first six months of 2024 are lower than the first six months of 2019. Property crime trends have been more mixed. Um, I'll get on to some of these trends in a moment. But overall, 11 of the 12 offenses declined from 2023 to 2024. Next what we're seeing in our most recent report is that homicide has shifted downward, or is trending to sh starting to shift downward. From uh, 2019 to 2020, the U.S. experienced about a 30% increase in homicide. Homicide continued to climb through 2021 and started to, to trend downward in 2022. However, um, it still remained elevated, about 8% by the end of 2023 compared to 2019. But what we're seeing after a 13% drop, the first six months of 2024 compared to 2023 is the first half of this year is about 2% lower than the first half of 2019. So at least for at this midpoint, we are below the um, 2020 levels. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> what you see here though, is that while many cities have experienced declines, about two, some cities have not, about two thirds of our cities um, have seen declines over this last um, period from 20, the first half of 2023 to the first half of 2024. Some cities such as Buffalo and Omaha uh, have seen increases over this period while Lincoln, Virginia Beach and, and Chandler have seen decreases. Next. While many cities are trending downward, about two thirds of cities still have elevated homicide levels the first six months of 2024 compared to that first half of 2019. Next slide. So it, it does pose this question of how do we have uh, this 2% decline and yet most of our cities are still experiencing increases. So we can take a look at two cities to highlight this these trends. So if we look at Denver and St. Louis, um, Denver decreased in homicide uh, 9%, while St. Louis increased in homicide by 5%. When we take a longer look, going back from 2019 to the first uh, six months of, of 2024, Denver has increased, uh, Denver's homicide rate is 28% higher, while St. Louis's homicide rate is 23% lower. So similar size ch um, changes in homicide, but in opposite directions. Next. So what we're seeing is that some of these cities with traditionally higher homicide levels are seeing these uh, larger decreases in homicide. So while many cities um, are seeing uh, more recent decreases, uh, such as Denver, these, these changes haven't been large enough, these decreases haven't been large enough to bring many of these cities uh, underneath their 2020 levels, so back to 2019 levels. So we're seeing some different trends in the data. So uh, in other words, a good portion of this overall homicide decline is being driven by these traditionally high homicide cities seeing fairly large decreases in homicide. Next slide. Um, our report looked at uh, multiple crimes, violent crimes and property crimes. Here are just, there's just a highlight of a few others. Um, these are aggravated assault rate uh, and gun assault change, uh, changes from 2018 to 2024. 
And um, it's, it's also important to note that not all cities had available data for all offenses. Uh, again, we encourage you to take a look at our report and, and to see what those differences are. Um, but when we look over the, the more, more recent period from 2023 to 2024, again, keep in mind, this is the first six months of each, each year. With aggravated assaults, there was a 7% decline. And when we compare that pre-pandemic year 2019 to 2024, uh, homicide the first six months of 2024 is about 0.02% lower. So slightly lower, but it's it's um, about where we were the first six months of 2019. When we go to gun assaults, uh, we see that gun assaults the first six months of this year compared to last uh, dropped by 18%. So a fairly substantial drop. And again, similar to aggravated assaults, is about um, the first six months of this year is about where we were the first half of, of 2019. Next slide. Uh, and just real quickly, uh, just turning to our fact sheet for a moment. Our fact sheet does uh, analyze some of these offenses. Uh, so we can have look at the long-term trends in aggravated assault from 1960 to 2022, which is currently the most recent uh, FBI data. And you know, the, the fact sheets, again, they allow to uh, contextualize some of these more recent trends. So the aggravated assault rate uh, peaked in 1992 and then dropped uh, 48% in, in 2014. So again, looking at these long-term trends, this volatility, um, and, and I suggest that when you when you look at these fact sheets, to keep in mind that they're not, um, that while they're com somewhat comparable to these reports, they are, are different samples and, and different methods. So please, please keep that in mind when reviewing this. Um, and also in the fact sheets, we can look at the share of aggravated assaults by weapon type. So from 1964 to 2022, uh, we see the the trends, the share of different weapons. Um, I'm sorry, the share of aggravated assaults com uh, committed by weapon type. Here, only gun assault is, is highlighted, but there are other weapons um, that are included in these data. Uh, but just for presentation purposes, only gun assaults are highlighted. And again, from 2019 to 2020, the proportion of aggravated assaults involving a firearm increased by 28%. So these are a really good resource to take a look for, for longer term trends. Next slide. Um, next, I want to discuss robbery and carjacking rates. Um, what we see in robbery is really the, a fairly notable decline from 2019 to 2020, as there were lockdowns in place as a result of the pandemic. There's a, a decrease in social activity, less people on the streets, less chance for victimization. So we see a, a, a you know, fairly notable decline in robbery from 2019 to 2020. And that trend um, you know, has essentially continued uh, overall throughout our entire observation period. Um, when we look at the more recent trends from 2023 to 2024, we see that there was a 6% drop uh, in, in robbery uh, the first half of this year compared to the first half of last year. And then overall, as I said, uh, we see this, this overall um, decline of 15% um, the first half of this year to the first half of 2019. Next. Now, a subset of robbery is carjacking. Um, uh, just note that carjacking in this report is only available for seven cities. So it's a much smaller sample th than robberies. Uh, and there is a notable difference in, the, in these trends um, that carjacking did start to increase notably in 2020 and continue to climb throughout 2023. But it looks like at the first half of this year, there was a substantial decline uh, in carjacking uh, of 26%. This the first half of this year compared to the first half of last year. However, overall, there's still... Um, carjacking rates are still about 69% higher the first half of 2024 compared to the first half of 2019. Next slide. Um, now we're going to start turning into some property offenses. We'll start with motor vehicle theft. And motor vehicle theft is something that uh, we, we covered quite extensively at, at the council, a series of uh, reports looking at motor vehicle theft, uh, including our, our fact sheet. Uh, we also note in our report that motor vehicle theft began to increase in the summer of 2020 and continued to climb uh, really each subsequent year. And as you can see in this graph, it um, you know peaked in, in 2023. Um, and 
But when we look at the more, more recent trends, the first half of this year, uh, compared to the first half of last year, motor vehicle theft is down by about 18%. However, um, after such a large increase from 2020 all the way to 2023, um, even with that decline, motor vehicle theft is still about 66% elevated uh, for the first half of 2024 compared to the first half of 2019. Next. Um, as I noted, a lot, there's been an overall recent decline in motor vehicle theft that many of these uh, cities, uh, about 25 or 36 cities that have motor vehicle theft data experienced some decline uh, in motor vehicle theft. However, when we look at these long-term trends from the first half of 2019 to 2024, uh, we see that only about five cities, I believe in our sample, had um, lower homicide, uh, excuse me, lower motor vehicle theft rates um, over this period. So while it lo looks like it is trending downward, still many cities are experiencing high rates of, of motor vehicle theft. Um, and that about 14 of these cities in our sample um, currently have motor vehicle theft rates that are 100% higher, so nearly double what they were in the first half of 2019. Next slide. Um, the last offenses we're going to be looking at will be larceny and shoplifting rates. Uh, we see with larceny, again, a fairly good, good size sample of 36 cities, that there was this, this drop in from 2019 to 2020, and then larceny slowly begins to tick upward. Um, and then uh, when we look at the, the most recent data, that the first six months of 2024 are 6% lower than the first six months of 2023. And taking a longer look, the first half of 24 compared to the first half of 2019, larceny uh, is about 9% um, lower th this year than in 2019. Next slide. Next. So, um, but that, that is not true for all types of larceny. Uh, shoplifting is a specific type of larceny. And, and again, note it's not the same exact cities we're, we're covering here. Um, Shoplifting is something that declined a lot during the, uh, the pandemic and lockdowns and uh, restrictions and movement, store closing. And after those restrictions have lifted, have, has slowly uh, returned back um, to, uh, you know, about pre-2020 pre uh, 20 levels. Um, but we are noticing that the first half of this year compared to the first half of last year, there was a 24% increase uh, in, in reported shoplifting. So, um, it does appear that at least in, in reported incidents that there's been an increase uh, in, in shoplifting. And um, that increase the first half of this year was um, enough to put the shoplifting rates about 10% higher the first half of this year than the first half of 2019. Okay, next. And again, lastly, just a note uh, with our fact sheets, we do have um, some long-term trends in, in larceny um, and different types of larceny. Um, and what we find is that overall, that um, the larceny rate uh, started to peak, um, like many other crimes in the 80s and 90s, and then became, began, um, started to decline. Uh, it's also important to note that we have data on the types of, of um, larceny. Uh, and you'll see that the, the share of shoplifting larcenies uh, nearly doubled from 1975 to 2022. Uh, it's a, also important to note that this is a measure of a share and not exactly uh, incidents. Um, and you can look at different types of larceny by um, by share of total larcenies. Okay. Next. So that's all I have for my presentation. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions I come across. Um, and I will pass it back to Stephanie. Thank you so much, Ernesto. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, and so we've had some questions come in in the Q&A, just a reminder that that Q&A function is there for you at the bottom of your screen. So if you have questions, please send them. Um, what I want to do first is turn to our incredible panelists um, in alphabetical order so that you know what's coming and uh, kind of get your reactions before I give you a few questions from our audience. So Drew Evans, I turn to you first. I'd be happy to. So thank you all for joining uh, today. And uh, I think that um, that was really interesting data that's been shared. And I think it, uh, you know, correlates a lot with what we're seeing. I'll compare it just as 
uh, an individual. The Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, uh, we are the state's investigative agency, and one of our functions is the statistical agency in terms of collecting the data uh, that feeds um, the, the NIBRS reporting for uh, our data collection for the United States. One of the things that's really interesting to me that stood out from some of Ernesto's uh, pieces that he went is so much of this is really localized. And what I'll give you as an example, in the state of Minnesota, when we look at these same trends for the same time period, statewide, our homicide rates uh, for the state of Minnesota are down 18%, and our aggravated assaults are down about 1% for the same time period from 2023 to 2024. However, when you look at the same data uh, for like the city of Minneapolis, for example, which drives a lot of crime in a state like ours in terms of the actual statistical numbers, our uh, numbers for them, our homicides are up 3% in the same time period and our aggravated assaults are up 2% during the same time period. However, the city next door, St. Paul, that shares many similarities, but they're very different cities, uh, they will tell you here uh, in our state, their homicide is down 31% during that same time frame, and yet their aggravated assaults are up 7%. And we could go into some of the others, but some of our suburban um, counties that in our we're a highly suburbanized area in the Twin Cities metropolitan area, it's a very mixed bag in terms of what they've seen during the same time period. And I'll just give a couple examples uh, quickly and turn it over to some of my other colleagues. Hennepin County, uh, which is, houses Minneapolis, it's our largest county in the metro area, is down 1% just as a total violent crime count when you aggravate the violent crime during that same time period. Uh, Ramsey County is up 8% during that time period, which is the city of St. Paul. And then Washington County, which is on our eastern border, uh, but is still connected to our Twin Cities metropolitan area, is up 49% to violent crime during the same time period. And yet uh, another county, as I'll give an example, Dakota, which is our southern Twin Cities area with a lot of large cities in it, is down 15% during the same time period. So I, it's my long way of saying I agree with everything in the report. I think it very much uh, is very city dependent and we've seen a lot of progress since we saw our spikes in a, a state like mine in that 2020, 2021 time period, we've come down. And at the same time, there's still work to do in pockets in terms of driving down violent crime in certain communities uh, in, in a, a state like Minnesota. And I'll uh, turn it over to my colleagues from there. Thank you, Drew. Um, I, I uh, would echo all of uh, Drew's points about um, the richness of the report and also the carefulness for which it's done. Um, as you can see, uh, struck by um, the complexity of the findings that we see, generally speaking, among the sample of cities improvements in homicide and violent crime, which is great news, though still we have work to do here. Uh, and about some mix, mixed um, findings with respect to property crime, especially, and those are large scale events that come to people's attention um, and um, keep them worried about crime more generally. Um, I also think it's important to um, remind um, people about the, you know, this is a unique data report in that it, it talks in, and contextualizes the complexity of crime in cities and in only those cities for which we have complete data for specific crime types. And um, so it's it's very, um, we need to be very careful about generalizing any of the findings to the national picture. But also, uh, as Drew points out with his examples from Minnesota, um, even with the city samples, you have to recognize that there's no, we, we obviously see here notable variation across the cities, but within most cities, you wouldn't find notable variation across neighborhoods and certain areas of the cities in these type types of crime, whether they're going up and down in particular areas, which also then tends to come to people's attention differentially and can, can make them uh, worried about crime. Um, I think um, one other point that Drew alluded to, too, is the fact that a large proportion of our population lives in non-city areas, and that is also a caution um, to keep in mind about um, what we can generalize from this, but it is an important um, signal that at least in many places, some and many of the most um, of the types of cities that have been plagued most by crime are, are starting to appear to turn things round uh, with respect to violent crime. So I'll turn that my comments over now to Alex Pacara. Thanks, Janet. Um, it's tough going last <laughs> because everything someone would want to say has already been said, but I'll find a way to, to highlight three points. The first one is I think. 
Um, you know, a lot of us in the in the academic community, in the policy community, in the nonprofit community owe a lot of gratitude and thanks to the work of the Crime Trends Working Group since it started filling in an important niche uh, in 2020. There wasn't that kind of real-time data occurring at that time, and so it was able to provide a, a kind of a pulse of what was going on in major urban cities in the United States and some smaller ones and has continued to this day. So I think that that's a, a real important point. A lot of us had turned to the council for that kind of work. I think the second point I'd like to make is that it's important to think about, as Jen said, what the report can show and the report can't show. And there's a lot of discussion, a lot of social media attention, a lot of rhetoric out there about, the, you know, the world is on fire with respect to carjacking. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. And, and you know, you always got to remember, you don't know what you don't know. And we have to put that into context. As Ernesto showed, we only have a handful of cities that continuously report carjacking data. And that's a large call for the, for the criminal justice data apparatus at the, at the federal level to start collecting the kinds of data, not just carjacking, but white collar crimes, environmental crimes, other kinds of crimes to really get a sense of what is crime like in the United States of America. And I think that the third point uh, I'd like to make is the council is one of several other uh, groups, outfits that are putting out crime reports. And I, you know, everybody can look at, well, it's some cities in this one, some cities in that one. The point of the matter is that regardless of which of these major efforts you're looking at, we're seeing the same substantive story that we're seeing across these trackers. Whether you look at homicide or other kinds of crime types, we are better off now as a nation and in many cities today than we were last year and the year before that and the year before that. So we're moving in the right direction. But I think from also from a policy perspective, this is also not a time to sit back and rest on one's laurels. This is the time to keep the, the pedal to the metal, to, to start bringing back all of the things that were put on the shelf when COVID and lockdowns happen that we couldn't do to do crime prevention and crime intervention that are focused from both policing and non-policing sources and strategies that the Council of Violent Crime Working Group put out. Um, so those are my three comments. I'll turn it back over to you, Stephanie. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. Um, so we've had some great questions come in. I wanna quickly uh, have Ernesto field a clarifying question from Ellen Gerst at the Chattanooga Times Free Press. Are these trends based on the number of reported offenses or the rate of offenses per capita? That is, do they account for population change, Ernesto? Uh, yes, these are these are all rates. Um, the only one that's not a population change is from 2023 to 2024, um, just because the 2024 population data is not available. So those are the same population. Other than that, um, the other years are, are adjusted for the population changes. Fantastic. And a follow-up question. Um, are there any cities omitted from the sample that are large enough as to affect the overall findings? So uh, yes and no. First, the cities that aren't included or that we've included in the past um, are not included because they're usually going through um, updates, such as Los Angeles is transitioning to neighbors. And so the data we use isn't, isn't really available. Um, but overall, when we compare this report to like our last report, we will find some percent differences. But um, as Alex said, with these different collections, different sample sizes, it's still telling that same story. So while some of the percentages may be a little bit different, I think it's still going to tell that overall same story. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I'd like to field some questions back to our panel. So is there a correlation between cities that are traditionally high and seeing big drops with intervention programs, given that on a federal, state, and local level, there's been a lot of innovation in violence prevention interventions? And I'm thinking I would turn to Drew for that first. Yeah, I can start. And it's an excellent question. I saw it come right in right from the beginning. And my short answer is that I think more study needs to be done. And the reason I say that is we've had a lot of innovation and a significant amount of investment in the city of Minneapolis, in particular with violence interruption. We've seen some positive results, 
but at the same time, there's been a real focus during the same time period on identifying those individuals committing the most violent crime in the community uh, and a myriad of approach in terms of prosecution, disrupting uh, gang structures that are in place at the time, along with these violence interruption programs that do um, seem to have an effect on this. So I think that additional study needs to be done in terms of this, and I think we need to continue to evolve how we study these violence interruption programs and to create some sort of baseline in terms of how to measure the effectiveness. I thought it was a great question. Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Alex, do you have any follow-up? Yeah, I think it's important to be mindful of, um, you know, that there's no one panacea for crime intervention right now. And when we think about crime prevention intervention uh, across cities, it's not just the city itself, it's patterns and pockets in a city that have differential distributions of crime and violence. But also at the same time, Stephanie, you know, there are 15 year old kids right now who might pick up a gun tonight, right? That's the that's the right now intervention part. But then there are five year old kids who in 10 years might do that. And that's the prevention part. That's a long term game. So we can't do one or the other. Both have to be done. And there needs to be a commitment from the highest levels of city, local and state governments that are going to prioritize public safety throughout their communities. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And uh, like Janet, as you noted in your opening remarks, crime is highly localized and this report really shows that. Um, do you have any follow-up thoughts? Uh, just a quick one. I know that, for example, in my own city of St. Louis, there have been also violence interruption programs and some focused deterrence programs um, emphasizing um, um, their efforts on the most highly involved um persons in crime. And those have shown um, um, some evidence of success. But again, um, I would echo the other points in that the um, period of follow-up for what designates success changes over time. You can't expect necessarily things to uh, operate, these kinds of programs to have immediate short-term effects. It might take a year or two even to evaluate whether the persons, for example, you were focusing on um, have ceased um, their involvement in crime. And so it is a it is a very complex issue, but I concur with everyone in the sense that we uh, need to continue to study this because um, what works in one type of area for one type of crime for uh, one um, follow-up period may not do the same for other types and requires different types of responses. Thank you so much. Okay, to turn to another question, uh, as Ernesto noted, we saw a dramatic increase in motor vehicle theft over the past several years. How much of this do you think was driven by the Kia Hyundai trend or are other forces at play? And I'll go to you first, Alex. Um, well, that certainly got a lot of attention <laughs> for sure when, when all of this started happening. But, you know, you also have to remember that you know, during the early stage of the pandemic, you know, there weren't cars being delivered and manufactured. We, we couldn't get them from other countries around the world. So it created this stock of a huge amount of demand, not a lot of supply. And, and that was true, not just for cars, for, for parts. And so you had this th these ready-made vehicles that are, you know, some are fairly simple to steal, um, but they were very easy to break down, chop them up and sell them real quick on the street for parts or put them on ships and get them over overseas. So it's a very quick crime to pull off and it's a very lucrative crime. Um, and so that's something I think a lot of cities in the United States um, started to struggle with and as Ernesto's data shows, uh, still continue to struggle with in the U.S. Other thoughts, Drew or Janet? The, we definitely saw a fairly significant uh, percentage share for the Kia Hyundai um, issues, certainly here in Minnesota. And so it definitely drove the numbers higher than we think they otherwise would have been while still agreeing with Alex's thoughts on that. I also would note that um, for us, juveniles in particular, um, those kids drove that number in a very significant way. There have been, and you've seen like the city of Minneapolis, for example, and the data that you presented today has seen a significant decrease. There's been a number of different programs, both in St. Paul and Minneapolis that have been instituted, including some um, diversion and intervention programs with juveniles in particular with motor vehicle theft that we are starting to see um, in the data to see some trends. So being able to address some of that and the new approach to juveniles. The other thing that uh, the data can't capture, but it can't be ignored both for violent crime and this is the role of social media media and what it plays in some of these crimes. We've seen that over and over again, especially when it comes to our younger crimes, 
driving some of our violence and on the motor vehicle theft issue as well. Thank you, Drew. Janet? Uh, yeah, just one final point to add is that another part of the um, car theft issue with respect to part stealing is associated with the value of commodity and the commodities market for metals and um, uh, co copper and batteries and things like that. And the higher the inflation rate is and the higher, especially that the inflation rate is of these particular types of of metals and parts is the more incentive there is to go into that kind of theft for both juveniles and more organized efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto, um, for giving us what appears to be a pretty heartening look at a decrease in overall violent crime, although some mixed findings in uh, property crime. And I think now I'd like to turn us to really talk about crime data infrastructure. So as I noted at the top of the hour, national crime trends data are published annually in the fall and they lag by nearly a year. So the lack of timely data spurred the creation of not just this crime trends report, but also of the crime trends working group. And so Zell, can you start our presentation again, please? And I will carry on as that is happening. I think it's gonna take a moment. So the group was founded in April of 2023 by the unparalleled scholar Rick Rosenfeld, who is the lead author for our crime trends reports until his passing in January of this year. The working group is made up of experts with diverse backgrounds. Next slide, please. They are academics, practitioners, research and data folks, people in state correctional law enforcement and public safety leadership, and folks who work directly to collect and analyze crime data across the country. Next slide, please. The group's recommendations were released last month and taken together, they create an actionable path to ensure that national crime trends data inform policy, practice, and political dialogue, guide government spending on public safety and criminal justice, and help Americans to be safe and feel safe in their homes and communities. Next slide, please. There are five dimensions to the group's findings, and I'll go through each one briefly and then describe the recommendations. Next slide. So timely crime trends data are the only data capable of informing policy and practice. You can see here the explosion of Kia and Hyundai motor vehicle thefts that began in late 2020 in Milwaukee, the epicenter of the viral Kia boys trend. This epidemic blossomed in a span of eight to 10 months. And by the time the national figures were out, Kia and Hyundai thefts had already declined in the hardest hit cities. Because of this gap, national data were simply not part of policymaking or intervention strategies. Next slide, please. Data accuracy is, of course, vital to our understanding of crime trends. Our nation has two complex systems that we've already referenced here today to collect information on crime. One that focuses on crimes reported to law enforcement called NIBRS, the National Incident-Based Reporting System, and another that asks people to disclose criminal victimization even if it wasn't reported to police called the NCBS, or the National Crime Victimization Survey. Most of the time, these two sources show similar overall trends, despite differences in the time periods they cover and their methodology. Although in some years, there are significant discrepancies like the one you can see in this graph. From 2021 to 2022, violent crimes reported to the police decreased, but people in the community reported increases in criminal victimization. NIBRS and NCBS are published around the same time in the fall of each year, but an explanation of what might be driving these differences was not released to help users understand these discrepancies. Another issue with data accuracy is that not all crimes are measured well, a phenomenon that becomes especially clear for those wanting to understand non-fatal gun assaults and injuries. Next slide, please. When we think about completeness, we're thinking about the population coverage of our national data. Law enforcement data reporting began to transition in earnest from a summary system that covered about 98% of the US population to NIBRS, a more complex incident-based system in 2015. There have been a lot of obstacles to this transition. And in 2023, less than 85% of the US population was covered by NIBRS. Currently, NIBRS coverage, as you can see in the graph, is really a function of city size. With New York and LA recently transitioning to NIBRS, we have significant coverage for our major urban areas, but smaller cities and rural ju jurisdictions just aren't counted. 
Completeness of crime data is also about the types of crimes that are measured, and there are several key crime types that are not well understood because data are not consistently collected or reported. Next slide, please. Even when data are timely, accurate, and complete, if they're not usable, then they're not used. The Crime Trends Working Group conducted focus groups with users at the federal, state, and local levels, and then most people told us that they struggled to access and analyze data from the Crime Data Explorer, the FBI's data tool. The breadth and depth of the data available through NIVERS, the law enforcement reporting system, provides tremendous opportunity for insight, but the complexity of the system has limited people's ability to use those insights to guide policy and practice. The resources that were developed to help states generate insights, like state statistical analysis centers, are often underfunded and understaffed, meaning that they're not conducting needed analyses or able to assist law enforcement agencies with training and technical assistance. Next slide. Many of these issues stem from the fact that there is no overarching governance structure and that the agencies who collect, report, and analyze data seldom coordinate. The budget for the Bureau of Justice Statistics the federal agency charged to collect, analyze, publish, and disseminate information on crime, criminal offenders, and victims is among the smallest compared to other federal statistical agencies. Although many have worked to update and expand NIBRS data collection, governance challenges have slowed innovation and have made it difficult to expand crime types and collect key details about many crimes. Next slide, please. So the group coalesced around three recommendations. Next slide. The first recommendation is about increasing capacity for crime trends data collection and analysis. This means first and foremost, increasing the number of people covered by NIBRS. The group also wanted to provide a range of institutional and technical supports to law enforcement agencies and states to help them with data reporting. The group also recommended that the FBI continue to collect crime trends data as they have the legacy and authority in that domain, but that the Bureau of Justice Statistics should lead reporting and analysis as they are the experts and the Justice System's primary statistical agency. Next slide. The second recommendation is for monthly statistics to be released for a representative sample of jurisdictions, creating a snapshot of recent crime trends across the nation. These data should also be available online in a format that allows users to explore and examine them easily and in context. Next slide. The third recommendation expands what data are collected and reported about crime trends to ensure Americans have access to a comprehensive picture of crime in their communities. It also enhances data collection about how guns are used in crimes other than homicide to guide violence prevention and intervention strategies. The group recommended that the two primary sources of crime trends information, NIBRS and the NCBS, be published and contextualized together so that users can gain a clearer sense of crime and criminal victimization trends. Next slide. And finally, the working group made funding recommendations to support this work, notably increasing appropriations for the Bureau of Justice Statistics and providing dedicated one-time and annual funding to ensure that the three recommendations could be brought to fruition and that key stakeholders from local law enforcement all the way to federal statisticians have what they need for success. Next slide. They also recommended reinvestment to provide additional support to the FBI's Criminal Justice Information Services, or CGIS division, allowing this vital office to enhance data collection and population coverage efforts, <clears throat> excuse me, and quality control. And the group suggested the expansion or creation of a range of programs to enhance data collection analysis and reporting, improve training and technical assistance, and integrate data across systems. So now I'll turn back to our panelists with some questions. Remember that you can submit questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen at any time. Okay, so we're gonna start with you, Janet. So what are some of the data limitations that we face locally and nationally with respect to real-time data? Okay, so this is an important question. Um, everything that we that is available in the council's report is based on um, data that's collected by police departments and and um, in this case uh, gotten from their websites by CCJ. Um, there is another major source of crime data collection in the United States. It has a different purpose and it produce, can produce different estimates um, and that's known as the National Crime Victimization Survey. The main difference between the two surveys is that not all crime is reported to police and the NCVS attempts to gather that information. 
uh, of crimes that are not reported to the police. They also have different coverages of crime uh, and details about crime, but one important issue is the populations that they cover. The um, NCBS is a household-based survey, and so it um, includes only persons who are living in households who are ages 12 and older. It does not include persons younger than that, or persons living in institutional arrangements like uh, nursing homes, jails, or in prisons, and it doesn't include crime against businesses. So all of that uh, th those types of crimes would come to could come to the attention of the police, but um, uh, cannot be measured in the NCBS. So there are two different methodologies designed to get at uh, two important angles of crime that we need to know about. One is what's not being reported to the police, and and then also the consequences of those crimes for victims in particular, so we can see, learn more about the harms um, associated with each of these crimes. That's its main advantage over um, police-based records. But um, like I said, they ha it has its own limitations with respect to what types of crimes it cannot measure. The major advantage, though, of the police data is that you can look at city-specific um, trends and patterns. And that is a very important local use of data, um, police departments use their own crime data for operational purposes. And that needs to um, be their primary, I think, um, emphasis. The, it makes the most sense to them. Um, and so those, are, uh, those two dis differences in the methodology means that there are different possibilities for improving its timeliness. But to say that one is more accurate than another is is not quite the right take on this. What you need to say is, what do we learn from this data set? How does it conform to what we know from that data set? And what is the broader picture of crime that we now have? When there are large discrepancies between the two surveys, as was noted last year, uh, some effort does need to be um, um, put in to explain to the, pu to the public remind them of the differences in the data sets, but also explain to the public why that might be and whether the discrepancies are notable enough to cause alarm or to cause a rethinking of what we know about crime. And um, so accuracy, um, for that reason, the council recommends this kind of joint consideration of the findings from both the NIBRS data and from the NCVS so that the whole, uh, the uh, a broader and richer picture can be presented at a single point in time. Thank you. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I feel like the NIBRS and NCBS are really two different ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. And so when you see those discrepancies, it's not that one is factually incorrect or wrong. It's just a different way of ask, asking a similar question. Exactly. And in that survey methodology, it would be very difficult to move the NCBS into a more monthly or more real-time Yes, it would be impossible. Um, so it cannot be um, more timely than um, the real-time indicators that you can get from some police records. Um, and the reason is that there's a six-month recall period when persons are interviewed, uh, asking them what's happened in the last six months. So it takes at least six months at a minimum delay to get this month's information of what events occurring in June, for example, we, we will need to interview people for another six months on that. So we, it's very challenging to make that more timely compared to the NIBRS data. Right. Um, and now I'll turn to you, Alex, especially as we move into this election year, Crime and public safety will be top of mind for both voters and politicians. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of accurate, reliable, and timely data? Yeah, you know, and this is this is really critical because a lot of statements are made by lots of different people. Um, and, you know, sometimes the American populace just takes someone at their word. And I, I certainly wouldn't take someone at their word. I'd want to know what the data look like. And as Janet said, what are the strengths of, and weaknesses of one data source and what are the strengths and weaknesses of another data source? As well as how they're reported. The NCBS covers a different time period than NIBRS does. And sometimes people lose sight of that. And then you'll have inter-reporting differences in crime types, as we saw in the in the report last year, whereas NCBS showed one particular crime type really increasing and the NIBRS data showed it decreasing without any explanation. So, so that, that can be confusing for people. 
Uh, and then some people will say, well, who do I believe? Which one data is right? And then they could throw their hands up in the air. So I think this is why it's so critical to provide objective data in, in its accurate as possible, as quick as possible. And a, a good analogy is what we all lived through at the beginning part of COVID when we were getting data on tests and hospitalizations and where that was occurring literally in real time. That was a public health emergency. And I would argue crime and violence is just as important to the American population as public health matters are. What that data was also able to show is the variability, Stephanie, at the city level. Here in Miami, they were tracking different neighborhoods that diff had different types of hospitalizations and positive test rates, and then bringing resources directly to those areas. And that's the value of real-time data that can be used to improve uh, communities and people in those communities. So in an election year, lots of statements will be made, lots of fact checking will be done, um, but the data are the data. And I think, you know, the American public is smarter than sometimes we give them credit to. We just have to make sure that we provide the data for them in a way that they can use and understand for their purposes. Great. And I think it's a wonderful analogy to use those early COVID days. And I'm wondering, Drew, if you have thoughts from the state perspective about the, the challenges in creating a near real-time data system and also the importance of identifying those challenges and overcoming them. Yeah, I think it's really important that we all continue to work towards that. I think that's an expectation of the public in many ways that we get as close to real time as we can with all the different information that we share on a daily basis. One of the challenges, though, that remains for all of us in law enforcement, having a country that's a very decentralized policing country creates unique challenges when it comes to gathering crime data. I think it was mentioned here, you know, a lot of the local law enforcement, they know their data very well. They know the impact to it, to their community. They know if it's going up or down and making sure that everybody understands this is a collective um, responsibility that all of us have to feed these systems so that we can compare and contrast and, and be able to provide accurate, timely, and relevant data to policymakers across the country as a whole becomes really important. We have over 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the United States. The state like Minnesota alone has over 430 local and state law enforcement agencies in this state. Sometimes the police chief that's responsible for responding to calls, working a shift themselves, as many of those agencies are 10 persons or less, is also the same person doing the crime data submissions on a monthly basis. That gets sent to us, they have to the 10th of the month, and then we have people that need to go, as been alluded to here, to ensure that the data is accurate, that there are issues with the data before it gets pushed up to the national system. We've seen improvements though. NIBRS was a huge step forward in terms of having better data for us to make decisions from. And there's going to be some growing pains, but the goals that were outlined in the report of that coverage are realistic goals that can be achieved. And it's really important for all of us to work together in the law enforcement community to push that, to get that 98 plus percent coverage so that this piece of the data is as accurate as it can be so that it can be used in the ways that we're already discussed with our colleagues for some of those other data sets that we collect. Yeah, and a question that came up or comment that came up in the earlier part was really about rural jurisdictions and how are they in, included in our crime trends report? And the answer to that is no, but often rural jurisdictions are not included in NIBRS because they don't have the infrastructure for their frontline officers to be able to report to NIBRS and the reporting systems are complex and expensive for small offices to be able to maintain. And so the Crime Trends Working Group really recommended strengthening uh, smaller agencies and rural jurisdictions with funding and support so that they can have the systems that they need in order to participate. Drew, do you have a follow? Yeah, and I would just, I think it's critically important. And I think that this is one of the roles the federal government does have to play in this field because that data is feeding the national picture on terms of crime trends. I was originally asked to sit on this group because Minnesota had widespread adoption of neighbors and asked, how did you do that? It was fairly simple. First, we have a law in Minnesota that requires reporting um, in the manner in, that we deem um, from the BCA. But more importantly, that different technology that's needed, we paid for it as a state agency and our legislature stepped up to pay for the adapters that were needed to feed the information to do NIBRS reporting. Little jurisdictions, small jurisdictions don't have the resources to do that in a timely manner. So that it's going to take months, years sometimes to be able to do that. That's where the state and the federal government can provide that assistance to get that reporting in those rural jurisdictions to make sure that we get them online. 
Great. And one more question. One of the largest recommendations out of this report was that the Crime Trend Work Crime Trends Working Group really advocated to shift the responsibility, not for data collection, but for data reporting from the FBI to the Bureau of Justice Statistics. And so I'll come back to you, Drew, and then I'll go to Janet. Um, how do you see that recommendation, the importance of that recommendation? Why did the group uh, advocate that way? So it was for a variety of reasons, and I'll, I'll leave it to the professors who know this much better than I to, to discuss some of the pieces of it. But I, what I will tell you this and bringing it to a state level is, you know, our statistical analysis center at the state of Minnesota is not in the data collection. We collect the data. The statistical analysis center is in our Office of Justice programs. And I've long said in my role that because I don't want to ever be accused of manipulating data to say a certain uh, outcome based on the information that we collected. In other words, I'd like that a step removed, be analyzing the data that we're collecting on a daily basis so that we're never accused of collecting data in some sort of mechanism that will either say crimes going up or down so that the data collection itself does not become politicized in any way that's been alluded to here today. Also, I think that it allows a, a separate agency like the Office of Justice Programs in our situation to be analyzing not just the data that we're collecting as law enforcement, but some of these other data collections to provide that context when we're issuing reports and saying what the crime trends are in a state like Minnesota. So when we bring that to the working group, we, I, my perspective in the group was that we the data collection FBI is a very strong partner of mine, both in state and nationally, that they collect that data. But the Bureau of Justice Statistics has that background to really be analyzing that data and what that data means in a much richer way if funded appropriately and provided the right resources to provide uh, more meaningful uh, reporting on that data itself. Thank you so much. Janet, I'll turn to you and then I'll come to you, Alex. Sure. Um, I think um, one of the key reasons for that is, uh, well, one of the key justifications behind that recommendation is that the, we that it's, the FBI does have um, good working relationships with state, local, and tribal agencies for collections of the data through, oftentimes through the state statistical analysis centers that that Drew mentions, and and they are um, those are should be respected. They're longstanding, and um, that makes them an excellent data. Um, gathering, uh, uh, excellent capacity for data gathering, but they're primarily an investigative and intelligence uh, agency and not a statistical agency. And, and that, this, the being a statistical agency creates specific burden um, uh, requirements uh, in the federal system. And one is that the agency must um, 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 handle the data and release the data following what are known as the principles of principles and practices of a statistical agency, which include transparency of methodology, um, um, truthfulness about the usability and the limitations and the strengths of the data, the accuracy of the data, very careful um, uh, presentation of the data, and without interpretation in the reports, that the, the, the data are presented as um, uh, in all of their details, and then the reader is left to decide how that should be interpreted. That is a key function of a statistical agency. FBI has a good relationship with the Bureau of Justice Statistics. They've been working together for years on different um, projects, including the NIBRS transition. And so that's one of the um, key reasons we think that that kind of uh, continuation and support of that relationship, but transferring the more of the burden of the statistics to the agency would be best for the country. Thank you. And uh, Alex, I will give you our last word before we close. We have about a minute. You are our senior advisor as a former BJS director. You are not part of our consensus-based process, but your thoughts and insights were absolutely invaluable in creating these recommendations. So Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. I echo uh, exactly what Drew and Janet said about um, the rationale and, and the, the, the benefits of doing so. The other thing I would simply add to this is, as you alluded to earlier, uh, in one of the main recommendations of the Better Crime Data, Better Crime Policy Report was the uh, publication of a joint document that has the crime data from the BJS's NCBS and the FBI's uh, NIBRS data. When you house those in one single agency that can produce the report at the exact same time and then have that explanation to the American public and policymakers, 
it makes a one consistent message that is from a federal statistical agency. And I think that has immense value uh, to the American public. I completely agree. Um, we have hit the top of the hour. So I want to thank everyone, my incredible panelists, my colleague, Ernesto Lopez, uh, and all of our audience members for joining us today. I glossed over this report so quickly, and Ernesto really covered the Crime Trends Report in, a, in such a, an amazing but quick fashion. Please access our full reports. I see a couple questions that are still unanswered in the Q&A that can be answered by uh, accessing the full documents. And so thank you for joining us at the Council on Criminal Justice, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event.